Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. Can you hear me well, speakers? Can you hear me? Can you not if you hear me? Yes, okay, that's good. Um, welcome all of you to the COVID-19 and mental health weekly webinar series that is organized, as you know, by the Lancet Psychiatry, with the Mental Health Innovation Network, by MHPSS.net, and of course, by United for Global Mental Health. Now, the aims of this series is to provide policymakers, practitioners, but also the wider health community with the latest evidence and insights on the impact of COVID-19 on the mental health of people and how to address it, of course. This is already the 11th webinar. It's unbelievable. Um, my name is Peter Ventevogel. I'm Senior Mental Health Officer with UNHCR, the UN Refugee Agency. And as part of my work with UNHCR, I um, was in a working group from the IESC Reference Group for Mental Health and Psychosocial Support in Emergencies. And that working group focused on continuation of MHPSS services during the COVID-19 pandemic. And that's closely linked to the topic of today's webinar, which is why they asked me to chair it, I think. The topic is stories from the field ensuring continuity of mental health care during COVID-19. So today's webinar will be really practice oriented. We will hear from service providers in different parts of the world, how they have adapted their approaches in order to be able to continue to deliver services for mental health and psychosocial support within their settings. And of course, they will share, hopefully, what they've learned while doing so. These four presentations are actually part of a larger project, which is organized by the World Health Organization, the Department of Mental Health and Substance Use, together with Mental Health Innovation Network. And the aim of that project is to highlight the incredible efforts and experiences, I may say, of individuals and organizations providing mental health and psychosocial support during the pandemic all over the world. So they've asked practitioners to document what they do and their innovative practices. And on the website of MHIN, you will find a range of inspiring case examples. And the website is www.mhinnovation.net. And I would say, check it out if you haven't yet done it. Now, today's format of the webinar is it's very simple, actually. We will have a round of brief presentations by our four speakers, um, followed by a round of questions from the audience. Now, um, if you have questions, please um, write them in the chat box um, so that um, our colleagues will be able to pick them up and channel them uh, to me so I can ask it to the speakers. Um, you can also use social media to promote the webinar or to react live. Then use the hashtag, hashtag COVID-19MH, all one word. And lastly, um, this webinar will be recorded, um, so it can be viewed later for those who do not have time to join us today or if you want to look at it again. Well, that was my introduction. I propose now that we uh, really start. As I said, our speakers are among um, the people who submitted entries for the project in mhin.net uh, um, and they um, describe their challenges with mental health service provision and the practical adaptations they made. So we go to all parts of the world and we start with Uganda. So I propose that we go to um, Alal Singaldora, who is country director of Thrive Gulu in Uganda, which is a grassroots organization um, providing mental health support to survivors of conflict in northern Uganda, which includes uh, local populations, internally displaced people and refugees. So um, Dora, can you hear me? Um, if so, I would like to ask you if you could share with us how Thrive Gulu um, has adapted their services to ensure continuity of care uh, in your setting. Over to you. Thank you, uh, Peter and the team and all our listeners. Uh, this evening in Uganda, this evening, 
Excellent, good morning. Thank you very much. Uh, um, I adopted this program to ensure continuity of provision of mental health care services in the following ways. Uh, one of our core objectives is to ensure communities have uh, correct information about mental health issues and they can know signs and symptoms early and they can seek treatment early. In terms of uh, creating community awareness around mental health, we've adapted to use of radio talk shows and short messages. Uh, we have adapted to use of caravan drives within villages for households that do not own radio handsets. So we have uh, singers mounted on vans with pre-recorded messages as well as uh, live messages from our counselors driving through the villages uh, and giving correct information around mental health uh, conditions, mental health services, availability during this COVID time uh, within the villages. And access to mental health services, we have uh, increased our support to the lay counselor structures who we are originally trained to provide more intensity mental health support, but also the first line respondents in the village. And their role is to provide more intensity as well as uh, make referrals to the next members uh, of the referral pathway. We've strengthened their capacities and we continue to strengthen them to provide services during this time. Uh, in terms of access, at the clinical level management, we have partnered with the government and psychiatric teams uh, to ensure that mental health medications are provided to the lower primary health care centers or facilities so that uh, our mental health patients who need a combination of therapy and medication are able to access uh, their therapy treatment routinely as well as we fill their, their drugs, as well as enroll um, new clients on board. Uh, during this time, of course, our coverage and numbers have been affected, but we are also happy to know that uh, we have served over 500 people, both with uh, our remote counseling being done by our counselors, as well as the telecounseling and their access to mental health medications. Thank you very much. Um, Peter, you are muted. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Dora. I wanted to say that this was really interesting what you were saying, um, because I know you work in a very resource poor area in terms of formal resources. And what I found very interesting is that you use the available technology that also your target groups have in order to continue the services. So I find these caravans that you use to provide information extremely innovative and interesting. Thanks for sharing that. But you also mentioned radios and radio shows. And could you tell a little bit more on that? What has been the impact of these radio shows um, to address misinformation around mental health and COVID. Over to you. Thank you again. Um, the radio talk shows uh, have a great impact in supporting our uh, reach and maintaining contact with the communities during this COVID time where we are not allowed to do any social gathering which we used to call and we are not allowed to do, you know, a lot of face-to-face -face contact has been very minimum. Uh, our radio, usually, you know, in many of our contexts, as we might be aware, that uh, communities have a lot of misinformation and myths around mental health conditions. And especially for us in Africa and in northern region, mental health is associated to witchcraft. So a lot of resources and time is spent by families trying to seek uh, traditional healing approaches. 
uh, have the expense of um, the modern um, professional mental health services. And you find that in that time, let's say, um, the mental health conditions are actually excellent, taking our clients to the next level, which is difficult to manage. So our video talk shows, we, we, we try to give correct information around uh, causes of mental illness, uh, signs and symptoms of mental illness. So that families can already observe signs early enough and they can begin to seek treatment. We emphasize the fact that early treatment, they need to seek early treatment in order to minimize the risk of many of our clients going to clinical management, where services is very expensive and also costly at some many of us to manage. But uh, our Indian talk show is some of the other examples that even for communities who are outside the graduated um, project coverage areas are able to benefit. Our Indian talk shows are searching for northern Uganda to South Sudan, uh, part of the um, machinery and uh, part of West Man. So you find that even those who are not originally directed within the project areas are continuing to benefit and they call you back and they get back to our counselors on phone and they still continue to access our services. Uh, our coverage now we are reached to about 6.5 million people through the radio programs. Thank you so much. We use um Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dora. The the line was at the last um, period a little bit bad, but I did get your uh, main point. So thank you for sharing that. It's really inspiring what you do. So thanks for sharing it. And I'm pretty sure there will be questions for you now. Let's move now to a very different part of the world. We go to Ireland, um, where um, we will be speaking with Paul Ferron, um, who is a psychiatrist and who's also the medical director of St. Patrick's Mental Health Services in Ireland, which is, as I've I understood, the largest independent nonprofit mental health provider in the country. Now, Paul, of course, compared to, to uh, what Dora told, your work is in a very different setting, but you faced your challenges as well in uh, how to adapt your services to ensure continuity of care. Can you tell us how you did that in your context? Over. Sure, Peter, sorry about that. Thanks very much for inviting me to speak today. Um, so in St. Patrick's, just to give you a little bit of context, um, we, uh, work in Ireland. We're based largely in Dublin, which is the capital. Ireland has a population of about 4.5 million people, and we provide mental health service to, services to about 8 to 10 percent of the population. We have 300 inpatient beds. We uh, see about 16,000 outpatient visitors per year, and we employ 700 staff. So we knew with a, a service of our size when the coronavirus hit our shores in late February that we needed to act really quickly and decisively and the really first priority was to decide very clearly what our priorities were. And for us, there were three. There was the safety of our service users and staff during this outbreak. Um, there was the need to treat as many people as possible to a highest standard as possible. And thirdly, in order to do that, we needed to remain open and viable as a service. So we needed to balance all of those three priorities. So in the initial stages, we acted very quickly. We realized what we needed to do, which is what all services did, which was adopt physical distancing. We stopped um, uh, visiting very quickly. We reduced footfall into and out of um, our services. We adopted remote working very quickly and obviously hand and respiratory hygiene. But we also adopted uh, remote working um, clinically very quickly. So for example, with our outpatient and our day services, we moved to um, doing them by video enabled or telephone means so within about two and a half weeks uh, of us starting this, 100% um, of our outpatients were being seen remotely. But perhaps the most radical thing we did, we realized that our inpatients, of whom we have capacity for 300, um, that there were going to be real challenges for people, both getting referrals to come and see us, to actually physically uh, visit us. I mean, remember, Ireland, like other countries, was in the midst of a lockdown with very restricted uh, traveling and that people might be afraid to come into hospitals for fear of uh, 
picking up the virus, or indeed they may have the virus and not be able to um, attend other services. So for all of these reasons, we explored the possibility of whether it would be possible to actually deliver the inpatient experience remotely from home. And we looked at each single individual aspect of what we deliver as an inpatient hospital from uh, nursing care to ward rounds to seeing a psychologist, occupational therapist to prescribing. And we found solutions to all of these uh, problems. And we rolled out a home care service um, that we offered to our inpatients. And that's been up and running now for uh, a good couple of months. So for example, as we speak today, um, about uh, we have about 80 um, current inpatients whom we're treating from home of our total of about 260 patients. And we plan to continue this service, I think, into the future. It seems to be well accepted and we're still working on it and getting feedback on it, but it's been surprisingly effective in these times. And we think it's a potential service um, delivery option that might continue into the future. That's amazing. Uh, that's really amazing, Paul. I can't. I can't. I can hardly believe it. What you're saying. So you, you actually say that people um, who have um, a need for being hospitalized briefly are actually getting the hospital care, but in their homes, and you deliver everything uh, online. Now, you told me a little bit, but I, I really would like to know a little bit more. And also, I. I you must have faced challenges. You cannot do this for everyone and and and, and everywhere. So tell us a little bit more. Sure, I'll, I'll start off with the broad challenges. First of all, um, we knew we needed to act quickly, but equally we needed to act carefully. We needed to inform people, and by people I mean both staff, um, service users, people who might be referring uh, of what we were planning to do and, and get, if you like, buy-in and acceptability for what we were trying to do. We weren't aware of this having been tried anywhere before. We needed to be sure that we got it as right as we could as, and as quickly as we could. We had a few advantages to start off with. Um, uh, one of them was that we were lucky enough to have um, developed an electronic health record about two and a half years previously, and that really was a game changer for us. It meant that um, we could actually, um, uh, both service users and staff um, could uh, work remotely. So for example, if we had a staff member who needed to self-isolate at home, but was still well, um, but just had to go through their um, period of self-isolation, they could actually work and do clinical work remotely while they were at home. Um, and equally, we could. Um, it meant we didn't have to search for charts with the attendant risk of infection, et cetera. Basically, any clinician could um, access the notes of any of their patients from anywhere, as long as they had a secure connection to, to their laptop. We also had some experience with video enabled working prior to the outbreak. We had some uh, cognitive behavioral therapy being delivered online, and we we're also piloting some work in the adolescent service. So we were able to apply a lot of our experience and just build on it, if you like. The other challenge, I suppose, but, just to go into a bit more. Sorry, one. Yeah, you, no, no, go ahead. I just, uh, no, go ahead. Yeah. Um, the other thing was just to look at the components of so um, we assigned uh, each patient to a specific team with specific nursing staff so they know they knew who um, they were talking to and who their team was. We even assigned them a physical bed in the hospital so they knew if you like what ward they were on. The reasons we did that were twofold. Number one to give service users the reassurance that if their mental state deteriorated and they needed to come to hospital quickly that they knew there was a bed there reserved for them. It also meant that we were able to know exactly our capacity for treating because we have a certain amount of beds and that's based on our um, ability to de deliver a high quality service. It was also very important for us to have clear criteria for people that would be suitable for this uh, service. It isn't for every, for example, somebody who might be acutely suicidal, they need to come into hospital. But having said that, there's a significant proportion of people um, for whom it's suitable, people who, first of all, who are agreeable to it, uh, who are suitable cl clinically in terms of their risk and their clinical profile, and also to make sure that every aspect of the care that they need can be delivered remotely. But if, if fulfill those three criteria, if you like, they were considered for home care. And uh, as I said, about a third of our patients since we've set this up have been um, uh, had their care delivered at home. Thanks uh, a lot, Paul. This is uh, amazing. And if people want to read more, they can go to MHIN. Um, and perhaps there will be questions for you. I find it fascinating. Um, but let's move on to another fascinating part of the world. We go to Iraq, to the Middle East, where we have with us uh, Dr. Wissam Al-Adhanun, who is a psychiatrist, 
and he works with an international NGO called International Medical Corps. And he's involved in providing mental health and psychosocial support for conflict affected people, which could be internally displaced people, refugees, but also the host communities. Now, we sum, um, as, you, as you get, I have the same question for you. Could you share uh, your experience with how you, in your setting, continued mental health care within that rather difficult humanitarian setting in Iraq? Uh, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Peter. Um, in Iraq, IMC providing services in many places in Iraq, and each place has its own situation that we have to adapt with. Uh, let me talk about my site. I'm working now in the, a camp the e of IDPs in the east of Mosul. Uh, this camp uh, showed now a movement restriction because of the crisis. Uh, and uh, so we have uh, no registered cases of COVID-19, uh, thank for God. Uh, but this, uh, you know, uh, this movement restriction uh, creates many other stresses, like uh, lack of jobs, like uh, being away from uh, family members outside the camp or of uh, or of movement uh, to the sit near cities. Uh, this uh, mental health distress of stress increased the stress of some people, of course, and we have to deal with that uh, by our mental health services. But uh, we also have obstacles because of that uh, movement restriction, like decreased availability in the camp, like uh, stopping tent visits, uh, like stopping group support, a group of psychoeducation. Uh, we stop the uh, training gatherings, of course, and that's uh, something bad these days. Uh, so we have to adapt and depend mostly on remote follow-up with uh, and management with the clients. So every uh, mental health uh, employee has uh, provided with a, a mobile line with free access to calling and to internet, and they follow up with the client. Of course, we have also some problem with that because you know, the, not every client in the camp, in the camp has uh, access to the phone uh, or there's a problem of privacy during the call and we have a problem with dealing with severe cases. So we have to deal with them with the limited times we can be available in the camp. Of course, except the, the problem of prescribing medication for them. I don't hear. Sorry, it's sorry. I do it again. I'm I'm too I'm I'm too fascinated to to talk to you immediately. So um, now I I think you 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 mentioned many things, but what I also understand is that actually um, the access that you have as a psychiatrist to the camp may be limited, but there is still primary healthcare going on, and that there are still doctors and perhaps also others who have been trained in mental health by you through this MH Gap program. So. Yeah. So, uh, can you tell us a little bit more how that works? What kind of strategies do you have to make sure that people who have been trained in mental health but have many other tasks continue actually delivering mental health services within primary care? And could you try to keep it uh, brief, as brief as possible? Yeah, over. Okay, uh, as mental health employees, we are thankful for IMC policy to integrate mental health with other, with primary health care and uh, other uh, surf, humanitarian services in the site of work. So we are always cooperating with them, coordinating our work with them and make a training for other services uh, staff, uh, or including of course GPs, uh, because they are very important parts of the working there. Uh, we train them on image gap, we're on uh, detection and referral, we're on uh, psychiatric first aid, uh, and this includes sometimes direct psychiatrist supervision on GPs during training, like taking cases. So uh, GPs now are uh, ready to help us. They are involved in the mental health care now. Uh, like uh, to, uh, yesterday and today, I could, couldn't go to the camp because of the movement restriction. So I have to do my job on call by phone. And so I uh, call the client to see how it's going with him. And then I call the GP and give him the instruction about this client who will visit nice. him. And uh, he prescribed him uh, the psychiatric medication, the psychotropic, and if he needs a refer outside the camp, he will do all that. 
That's interesting. So you are still actually uh, working with the GPs as well as with the clients. Uh, thank you very much for this. Um, um, this is great. And again, an, uh, a good uh, way of using the available technology in the setting where you are. Talking about technology, we are now going to Chile, where we have a technological problem, because you see the screen is black, um, because there were just at the last moment some um, problems with the camera. So you will hear our colleagues from Chile, but you will probably not be able to see them. Now, um, um, I will. Um, we have with us um, Javiera Rojas Uribe, and also Hello. Francisco Munoz Martinez, and uh, they are joining us from Chile, from the Ministry of Health at the Valparaiso San Antonio Health Service. And they are involved particularly in mental health and psychosocial support to families. So I'd like to start with Javiera. Um, Javiera, can you uh, give us a sense of how your team has adapted the services to ensure continuity of care? Over. Hello. Well, yes. because of the pandemic, we had to transform ourselves. Information and communication technology are not widely used in health intervention in Chile. We are very oriented to face-to-face -face interaction. This generates the need to innovate and generate different action in mental health service to maintain the continuity of support of the population. In this aspect, we will focus in the strategies to maintain therapeutic support for families of boys and girls in primary mental health care. Through information and communication technology, the usual coverage and frequency were recovered, mainly using remote means, such as cell phone, text message, and information technologies, to monitor and intervene despite the restriction of the pandemic. Smartphones were acquired, and video conferencing equipment was used for remote intervention with families, as well as for remote collaborative assistance between primary care professionals and specialists in mental health care. Thank you. You are muted again, Peter. I am really not good at this. Um, yes. Um, so, um, Javier, I, I, I understand that you, you, you had multiple strategies that you did, but one major thing was that you had to stop doing home visits, physical home visits. So can you tell us a little bit more about the impact of, of, of that and what you did to, to mitigate the problems over? Sure. Um, the contents of the broad family intervention approach were adapted so they could be more easily distributed through digital means, including the use of cell phones, video calls, and social networks, ensuring that mental health care information can be delivered at distance through infographic, manuals, videos, and audios. The purpose of using social networks like Facebook is to promote healthy thinking and the development of different self-care strategies, creating instances that allow families to anticipate situations that could affect their mental health. It has also been used to suggest tools for conflict resolution, emotional management, behavioral management of children at home, Reading exercise, among others, that allow families to talk about their experience. This approach to family intervention through remote means, as well as raising the frequency of the therapeutic contact, has allowed for easy transmission of the information, generating more motivation and perception of self efficacy as the families themselves feel the main responsibility for change. It has also been observed that families have a greater knowledge regarding their mental health which increase their ability to express their needs and provide mental health professionals with more information to support and meet the needs of the family. Community networks with church, church neighborhood center, universities, and other social organizations were also activated to com complement the work of primary health care with virtual support offers in, spirit, in spiritual, educational, occupational, and socioeconomical fields, among others. Thank you. Thank you so much, Javiera. If you want to uh, read more about the work of Francisco and Javiera, um, visit MHIN as well. So um, thank you very much. I have some questions already from the audience. I will start with a question for Dora, if you are ready. It's about your radio shows, of course, I knew it. Um, so the question is, what sort of speakers 
do you invite and how did you ensure that the language they use is appropriate and inclusive towards people with mental health conditions? And could you try to be brief, let's say one, two minutes max? No, over. Thank you. Um, the speakers that we uh, facilitate on our radio talk shows include uh, psychiatrists from the government health facilities, our own trained counselors, uh, the main structures, the community led counselors within. Uh, we take care of diversity of uh, language. Majorly in the region where we are working, the commonly spoken language is actually, which is like 80%, but also take care of our South Sudanese refugees by use of translators uh, who are part and person of our trained volunteers within the settlements. And we, we, we work with them through the radio talk shows so that they can speak the commonly spoken language uh, for South Sudanese refugees. Uh, in okay. Now that that's clear, so that's that's quite a challenge. I think you use all kinds of different languages eh, to reach the people. But then the question is also about: um, Do you use appropriate language? I'm a, I'm a psychiatrist, and I know we sometimes use difficult words. The the, the are the people we work with don't understand us. How did you deal with that? V very briefly, but just I'm just interested. Um. Usually, so definitely, you cannot completely run away from some technical words uh, during any of our programming, but we try as much as possible to, to translate, uh, to simplify, uh, to the level that a uh, layperson can understand what we are talking about. Like when we are talking about signs and symptoms, we really simplify to, you know, the basic that a layperson can understand. Yeah. I think that's very important. Thank you for sharing this. Um, great. Um, the next question is for Paul. Um, and um, well, the question is a lot of health systems are trying to make the move to remote care. But in hindsight, what are now the main recommendations that you could make to service managers in particular who are at the beginning of that process uh, to migrate to services online? And then in particularly um, about um, uh, how to allow staff and clients to access the necessary technology platforms. So how do you do that with access, safety, etc.? cetera? Over. Uh. Sorry, Peter. Part of that question answers itself by implication is that you do need a really good uh, liaison and relationship with your clinical services, your IT services obviously in particular um, management and your service use, they all need to collaborate on this. And it's, um, it's important to decide what platform you're going to use. For example, we, um, we use Microsoft Teams for a variety of reasons, mainly because it's got a very good security um, uh, built in. It also uh, builds in nicely to our IT infrastructure. Um, the IT side of things, for example, when we're admitting somebody to a home care package, um, we've got a special subsection of our IT service called Suits, the service user IT service, who proactively contact that person and get them set up with their uh, with their IT infrastructure so that they're up and running. Um, I think you need to be very clear on what your objectives are and what you can and cannot deliver and not try to overreach. Um, I think also, as I said in my presentation, having an electronic health re record is a massive advantage. Um, of course, when we talk about um, uh, telemental health, we're not just talking about video. Not everybody has a, a video enabled device. A telephone is also there. So there are certain parts of services and certain people for whom telephone works better. We have a certain proportion of our patients who are receiving remote services who uh, have it purely by telephone and they're very happy with it. Um, I think the other thing which we're considering at the moment, because this is still very much stuff that we're getting experiences in as we go is the idea of um, people being able to uh, meet their team physically at some point along the journey, even if it's just at the beginning, a sort of a blended or hybrid care approach where it's partly remote and partly physical, but exactly what the balance of that is, we don't know yet. I think, and I think as I said before, buy-in is really important. Everybody, all the stakeholders involved need to be um, need to be positive and, and, and um, think this is a good idea. Um, and that's patients, staff, and um, the organization. If it's done half-heartedly, it's not likely to work. 
thank you. That's very clear. So it needs actually a collective effort. Eh? Yeah, thanks. I have um, a, a brief question as well for Francisco and Javiera in uh, Chile, um, which is you explained a bit how you worked in, within the families that you work with, but the question is how do you work with families who are, let us say, disadvantaged, the poor families who may not have good internet access or may not have telephone access? How do you work with the disadvantaged and the poor? Could you briefly say something about that? Over. Okay, so um, that is that is a common reality here. Not everybody has internet access. Um, so what we do mainly is um, telephone interventions in that case, uh -huh. and we uh, we try to. Uh, get everybody's contacts and uh, try to get them on the phone. And if that doesn't work, um, we uh, try to uh, still make social visits, make home visits, uh, having every protection you know, for, for the health workers. And um, in, in, you know, in, in case we can't do any of that, or it doesn't work to in, in, a, in a quest to massify the information, we work on social networks. And that is what, uh, a, okay, how that's, you know, that's, that's a, because if they, have, if, if they don't have regular internet access, they can still access once in a while, at least with, a, with somebody else. Right. So all of those things. Okay, that's a clear answer. That gives me a bit of a picture on how you try to get everyone on board. Huh? Thank you very much, uh, Chile team. I have a question for Dr. Wissam uh, as well, um, which is actually, you hinted, you told me us a little bit. The question is, how hard is it to keep people thinking about their mental health and looking after their mental health during a crisis where people have so many pressing priorities? You mentioned them about livelihoods, about uh, jobs, about food. Uh, how do you ensure that people do not forget their mental health? What strategies do you use? Over to you. Okay, uh, of course, by following their up, uh, even when we are not available at camp, they are thankful that uh, we talk, we call them. And for people who are not uh, having uh, phone access, we uh, just send uh, for the, uh, the outreach to the tent and uh, we uh, call them from the phone of outreach in the center or uh, the tent. Um, and uh, we always uh, say that these problems that happen now uh, have a price, that you, uh, you don't have COVID-19 in the camp. So we don't have, a, we don't see deaths. We don't see, because it's a very poor, there are very poor families. There are very poor conditions there. So if there's COVID-19, it will separate very fast there. So they feel thankful for that. And uh, this increase their patience for this, uh, 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 movement restriction and this crisis, but uh, uh, also we follow up with the new cases. If there's any new case, we follow up the relapsed cases, cases of uh, mental health problem. Uh, we do uh, instructions on walls, how to do uh, with stress, how to deal with the stress of COVID-19, how to deal with the stress of staying home. Uh, we do sometimes uh, individual sessions to talk about that or we just make on uh, instructions on walls uh, every place uh, in the camp. Okay, so you try to reach them in many ways, eh? Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Okay, great. That that that's that's uh, very very good. We have time for one or two questions more. So um, I have uh, one which is actually for both uh, Paul uh, from Ireland and for Wissam. So you can maybe both say something briefly about it. It's from uh, a colleague who works at the Douglas Mental Health Institute in Canada and who would like to know whether all these innovations that we now have are also recovery oriented. So to what extent are you also able to um, work in um, a recovery oriented way um, because that element may be not so easy to do online uh, because it may be very much focused on symptoms and on, um, and on uh, uh, yeah, functioning problems. So could Paul, could you say a little bit about how you work to 
recovery and if that is possible sure. in this setting? Sure, I'll be very brief. I mean, I think this does fit a recovery model of treatment rather well. First of all, you're treating somebody in their own home rather than bringing them into hospital. So they're in their own environment with their own family, which is usually a good thing. Um, I concentrated perhaps in my presentation on the acute stuff like medication and that, but um, you know, remote working isn't confined to that. We have our occupational therapists do an awful lot of work. Um, we have recreational and social activities um, online as well for people. I mean, I think, I suspect this model of home care will, will evolve with us. It won't necessarily be always inpatient based. It might move to sort of a hybrid of, on the one hand, outpatients where you see somebody every few months for, at a clinic versus inpatients at the other end, I think this has the potential to fill in that middle ground for people who are struggling a little, a little bit, not necessarily needing to come into hospital, but needing more support than usual while remaining in their own home. Right. Okay. Okay. So yeah, it is possible, but uh, yeah. Okay. And then with some uh, same question for you, like in the setup where you have now, can you do more than only providing medication and and, and psychiatric care, or can you also work to to actually um, recovery and empowerment of patients in the setting that you have? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, okay. Uh, this is you know this is a new situation here to for many, pay, many specialists to work on phone or by remote uh, follow-up of patients. Maybe for me, because I have my own uh, online uh, psychiatric clinic since uh, seven years. So mm -hmm. I have some experience uh, with doing that. Uh, I deal with patients by calling a session 30 minutes uh, at least for each one, at least sometimes one hour. Uh, I involve family with the support. Uh, I want, uh, of course, psychoeducation about his situation now as what have to do. Sometimes I send him to the primary health care to do some investigation if he needs or to check some, uh, some uh, to do some assessments for him and he feed me back with the situation. Or sometimes I uh, talk to the doctor himself during the patient uh, availability with him or with a pharmacist to, to, to explain okay. what you have to do or to, to, or to, uh, what to take and how to take it. So it's still quite comprehensive what you try to do then, huh? Yeah, of course, because okay. of our experience. And we do some instruction, give some instruction to the other, um, uh, mental health staff in IMC, uh, what to do, how to deal with the cases. Of course, they don't have the problem of uh, prescription medication or following that medical case, uh, mm -hmm. because they are mostly case managers and those issues. Right, right. Okay, well, I love to know more from all of you, but I have one last question. I would like to ask it to Chile. Um, so if you are ready, um, the question to Chile is about children, because we haven't talked much about children and your program is about families and children, but how difficult is it to engage children in, in family-based interventions during a lockdown where they're sitting home? How do you engage the children in the therapeutic work? Over to you. They're translating now because not all of we have one person who speaks English who will present the, the answer. So if you're ready, let us know. Okay, so uh, the, the main thing uh, we do with, with uh, children is to send videos to the families, to the mothers in particular, but not exclusively, so that they can um, uh, work with their children. And we try to engage them on, on the telephone too. Um, so, so we can use uh, different techniques for emotional management or behavioral management uh, with the children. But the, the, the main, the main uh, way to access the, uh, and to engage children is to work with their parents, basically. And in the, that, in that way, we can develop with the parents um, the skills or, or, or the, the, to work on, on ways to treat and to work with their own children. And we okay. can support that with our interventions. Yeah, so that is the secret. I still continue working with the parents in particular. Yeah.
Now we have to end now because we are running out of time. Um, I would like to um, uh, to tell all of you that if we uh, you have questions, you can also go on Twitter if you have that using the hashtag hashtag COVID nineteen MH, and some of us will remain on Twitter to answer your additional questions. But I would now like to end with hearing one take home message from each of the four panelists, something you really want the audience to remember. So I start with Dora, what would be your key point? Over to you. Uh, thank you, Peter, once again, and our audience this evening. Uh, my key point is for us to tell more about um, the aftermath of COVID, during an aftermath of um, after the COVID-19, the mental health needs are going to increasingly be high. Uh, I want to say that I think across the world, funding uh, resources for mental health has always been unprioritized and very limited. And I want to say thank you to all uh, donors, uh, supporters in different ways who support mental health work across the globe. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dora. I hope the donors are listening. I totally agree with you. Um, let's go to uh, Chile now. Our Chile team, what would be your take home message for the audience? Over. Okay, so we, we, we believe that uh, it's one of the most important things is to take advantage of the pandemic to install innovative practices so we can ensure continuity of care. And, and this must include the articulation with civil society organizations, which can also provide psychosocial support. That is what we yes. believe innovation and articulation with uh, civil society organizations. And that is great to hear because you're working with the government service, eh? that you from that position actually say we need to work with civil society. Thank you very much. Let's go to Wissam, to Iraq. What is your take home message for the audience? Okay, I have two points, two important points to mention here. First, uh, it's uh, to the uh, health authorities and to medical organizations to integrate the mental health with the work of the primary health care because it's a very important part of the medical work. Uh, and the second point uh, is to try to do a continuous training on mental health programs like uh, MHGAP, uh, psychiatric first aid detection, refer for all the medical staff or all the organizations the staff because you don't know when you will need it that's right that's what the crisis has proven eh? sometimes you have to do yeah. it with the general practitioners you have to prepare them yeah now paul um what is your take home message for the world yeah for me it, okay for me it's that you need to be really clear about what your main purpose and um, your main reason for getting up in the morning uh, to do what you do is and then get and do it, be proactive, decisive, use your imagination, be innovative. Don't wait around to see what other people are doing. And when you're doing that, get feedback continuously from those around you, they, your service users and staff, and learn from that. I think all the evidence is that at a national level, at a service level, that people who got up and did things innovatively um, fared better than those who waited around. Right. Now, um, that's also a very clear message and I hope people will take it. Um, thanks a lot. We have to end this webinar now. Um, please continue with asking questions or continue the discussion on Twitter um, and come back next week. Same time, again, a new webinar with new people, new information and exciting things to learn. Thank you all very much. Thank you to the organizers and thank you to the audience and sorry for taking Slightly more, yeah, four minutes out of the time. Bye. Thank you.